Hey, brother! Guys, have you ever wondered what happened to Voldemort after he attacks Harry with Avada Kedavra in the Forbidden Forest? Harry, of course, goes on to have this incredible lengthy discussion with Dumbledore where he reveals all of the mysteries of the books up till this point, including Dumbledore's own backstory, which he continues to lie to Harry about, even in death. Didn't see Grindelwald again until our famous duel in 1945. How do you explain this? It's like on national global broadcast with television. Also, it feels like you left out some very important details while you were counseling Harry on defeating one of the world's most darkest wizards considering the fact that you have a considerable amount of experience defeating the world's darkest wizards. <sighs> Digress. The real point here, though, is that ultimately Harry is given this decision as to whether or not from this place that he's in, he wants to pass on to death or travel back to the land of the living where he can actually take one final stab at defeating Voldemort once and for all. But after Harry does make the decision to return back to life, we discover that Harry wasn't the only one impacted by Voldemort's spell. Voldemort himself is also kind of recovering and standing back up from the impact. So the big question here is, what happened to him during this entire sequence of events? Did he just get knocked unconscious? Did he have his own version of King's Cross Station, if you will? Was he actually the gross baby looking thing listening in on Dumbledore and Harry's conversation? Or was that the piece of Voldemort's soul that had been existing inside of Harry this entire time? And on top of all the rest, what would have happened if Harry had made a different decision? What if he had just decided in this moment to simply pass on? Well, today we find out. Okay, so the King's Cross scene is filled with so many huge plot points that all simultaneously seem to try to satisfy the various themes of all seven books. So let's walk through the entire scene step by step to ensure we don't miss anything. So what we know is that Harry learns that he must accept death, that this is the path to victory. And as such, he walks into the Forbidden Forest unarmed and prepared to die. He is hit by Avada Kedavra and wakes up in a white void that we ultimately learn is actually King's Cross Station or a version of it. And this space that he is existing in is what actually happens instead of passing on to death. And the reason why this happens goes all the way back to Goblet of Fire where Voldemort specifically wants to use Harry's blood to return his physical form so that he can physically touch him, which does in fact work. But it also means that Harry's mom, Lily, sacrifice continues to exist on inside of Voldemort, effectively creating what we've always affectionately referred to as a love crux, tethering Harry to life. Because as you will recall, normally a horcrux is a container that holds a piece of someone's soul to achieve the same purpose. In this case, Voldemort has become the container holding a piece of Lily's love for Harry. And as a result, Voldemort's very existence anchors Harry to life in the same way that the piece of Voldemort's soul inside of Harry Harry anchors Voldemort to life. This is the whole neither can live while the other survives bit. But so then the question is, what actually happens when Voldemort hits Harry with Avada Kedavra in this case? Well, the short answer is that neither of them actually dies for real, but they find themselves in a place called Limbo. This is going to be the space found between life and death, and for Harry is represented by King's Cross Station. And the reason why it is specifically King's Cross Station for Harry in particular is because that is the physical location where Harry left the muggle world behind him and entered the wizarding world. It's where his old life ends and his new journey begins. Incidentally, he does this through platform nine and three quarters, which is very interesting when you consider the fact that Harry is born on July 31st and his family is attacked exactly 15 months later on October 31st or Halloween. The interesting thing about specifically 15 months later is that it also happens to be one and one quarter years after Harry was born and Harry is collected by Hagrid on his 11th birthday almost to the very second, meaning Harry lived in the Muggle world with the Dursleys for almost exactly nine and three quarters years. It's just mind blowing. All fun facts aside though, that is the reason, if you've ever been curious, why Harry's version of Limbo takes the form of King's Cross Station. And it's also what could happen here inside of Limbo. He could leave his actual life behind and journey on to the great beyond. It's a metaphor. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, sure, yeah, that's that makes perfect sense for Harry, but what about Voldemort? Wouldn't he have some kind of say in what this limbo looks like 
too. After all, it seems like Harry, at the very least, is able to materialize anything he wants or needs, including fresh new robes or his old principal. It seems like if Voldemort was having a say in this space in some capacity, that it would be like raining snakes or there'd be like skull lined wallpaper or something. Certainly it feels like just less white overall. That being said though, I do still think there's an argument to be made for the fact that for both Tom Riddle and Harry, boarding the Hogwarts Express was a fairly similar experience. So I guess there is an argument to be made for the idea that like this is the place that both of their subconsciouses were able to agree or decide on. In fact, at one point in time, Harry is actually able to fully understand and relate to the fact that Tom Riddle felt so much more at home at Hogwarts than he ever did at the orphanage. However, all that being said, I don't think Voldemort has any say about this space whatsoever. As Dumbledore says, this is your party, or whatever. Not whatever, specifically what he says is, this is, as they say, your party in chapter 35, Deathly Hallows. Of course, the fact that Dumbledore is there at all is also kind of like the exception that seems to prove the rule. On some level, it feels like he has his own ability to just simply be there at all and not provide Harry with information that he needs, but with information Harry couldn't have ever known otherwise. Like, it's not information that Harry always maybe deep down knew inside. It's like actual intimate details about the Dumbledore's family's history and his relationship with Grindelwald. And so how Dumbledore is there in the first place and able to convey this information to Harry is kind of a mystery unto itself in a video for another day. So be sure to subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. It helps. Either way though, there is someone else inside of the scene who is absolutely positively and definitely present for everything that's going on. And that is Voldemort. One of the things that simply can't help but stick out inside of this scene that otherwise seems warm and cozy and fuzzy is the bloody skeletal fledgling remains of Voldemort that Dumbledore sort of seems to ignore off in the corner. And when I personally first, and actually many times after that, read this particular passage, I always sort of assumed that what we were seeing there was the piece of Voldemort's soul that had existed inside of Harry all these years. Like a physical manifestation, if you will, of the part of Voldemort's soul that made Harry a Horcrux. And so it felt like what we were seeing was Harry's whole and complete soul in warm and comfy robes, while on the other hand, the fragment of Voldemort's soul was just this strange skeletal baby thing. Both individual occupants of this particular form of limbo. Harry, of course, makes the decision to return back to life and that piece of soul simply moves on, thus it is destroyed, making Harry one step closer to fully and completely defeating Voldemort. That has been my interpretation of this scene for a very long time, and I feel like it makes sense, and yet also, I still don't think that's what's happening. Instead, that piece of Voldemort's soul that lodged itself inside of Harry, the piece that makes him a Horcrux, the piece that allows him to speak parcel tongue and have that strange connection with Voldemort, that Horcrux was immediately destroyed by Voldemort himself with the Avada Kedavra curse. It's gone. It itself has no other anchor. It dies right away. Meaning that flayed baby skeletal thing, that is Voldemort Prime himself, the actual man leading the opposing army, the Dark Lord, the one who just cast Avada Kedavra. That's him. What we are seeing is a representation of both Harry's and Voldemort's souls. Harry's is whole and complete, but Voldemort's on the other hand has been ripped to shreds. That's why Harry is capable of controlling his surroundings, summoning anything that he needs, conversing with Dumbledore. While Voldemort on the other hand is just stuck locked in a constant state of suffering. And this might be kind of surprising because when you see Voldemort out in the real world, he's tall and strong and formidable, healthy-ish, if not a little bit noseless. But what we're seeing is what he would look like on the inside, what's left of his soul. In fact, he's probably even worse off than just simply the damage that he has done to himself by ripping his soul to create all of his various horcruxes. Because if you'll recall, all the way back in the Philosopher's Stone, we see that Quirrell is drinking unicorn's blood as a way to sustain Voldemort while they're sharing that body. And Ferenzi tells us that anyone who does this will continue to live on, but they will live a half-life a cursed life. And while this obviously sounds bad, we never get a really obvious explanation as to the implications of it for the rest of the series. Until 
this very moment. This is what your soul would look like after ripping it eight times for various horcruxes, drinking unicorn blood, and just countless other murders that weren't intended to create other horcruxes. This is also why you don't have to feel even an ounce of worry about Dumbledore being rude or mean to something that vaguely resembles a baby, because it's definitely not a baby. It's Voldemort. And guys, we need to pause real quick right there to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, me undies. Let me tell you what, guys, I am personally at my best when I'm talking about my favorite fandoms with my favorite people. It's really when I'm most comfortable because feeling comfortable is more than just about what's touching your physical skin. It's about feeling comfortable in your own skin, a sentiment that's shared by MeUndies. And MeUndies carry silky soft underbritches and clothing in your favorite pattern so that you feel at your best at all times. Their specific care for style and substance is honestly, for my opinion, unparalleled. I personally have been wearing MeUndies for years at this point and love them to the point where my wife actually asked for her own subscription. When I got my first few pairs though, I could immediately tell the difference and right away I was like, well, I can't wear anything else because nothing else compares in terms of comfort. Plus, I always love to subtly celebrate my various fandoms, and I can definitely do that with these Grogu prints, of which I now have like multiple pairs, no big deal. And guys, the MeUndies membership is awesome. Each month, you can pick a new pair of undies, socks, or a bralette at a discount. And trust me, you can never have too many of these items. It will help build your collection quickly and affordably. With that membership, you get 30% off all of the snuggly softness you can handle. And you also get access to special deals and other accessories too. And you can get 25% off your first order plus free standard shipping when you head on over to MeUndies.com slash theories. Remember, if you're not satisfied, then your order is on MeUndies. So again, get 25% off your first order and free standard shipping when you head on over to MeUndies.com slash theories. One more time, that's MeUndies.com slash theories. Link in the description down below. So to answer the initial question of what does Voldemort see inside of his version of Limbo, inside of King's Cross, some argument can be made for it's exactly the same thing as Harry. He's in the same place. But I also think the real answer here is that he's not seeing anything at all. He is just simply and completely suffering. So when we see him reawaken in the forest, that's what he's awaking from pain. But that being said, here's another question I've spent a lot of time wondering on. What would have happened if Harry had made a different decision? What if he had decided to simply move on, board a train, leave? And with that, I don't just mean like what would have happened to Harry, but what would have happened to whatever that version of Voldemort is as well? And while it's certainly hard to say for sure, here's what I think. If Harry had made the decision to simply move on, then Harry, of course, would just have simply died. And with that, I think that that fledgling version of Voldemort would have gone with him, and that piece of Voldemort's soul would also have been destroyed. Which means that if you were a Death Eater watching this scene unfold back in the Forbidden Forest, what you would have seen is both Harry and Voldemort collapse and neither of them ever would have returned to life. And you might be thinking like, well, hey, that's really not a bad outcome overall, right? I mean, Harry had gone into the forest intending to die in the first place, and this absolutely ensures that Voldemort's destroyed, right? If that's the case, then why risk coming back? And there's two reasons, actually. The first is that Nagini is simply still out there, yet to be destroyed. So what would really happen there is that Voldemort Prime, if you will, would be reduced back to like a mist version or form, which is kind of how Quirrell finds him in the Forest of Albania, or kind of like what we see fly through Harry at the end of Philosopher's Stone. Or that piece of him, the Voldemort Prime piece, would just be totally and completely gone. But that piece of soul inside of Nagini would continue to anchor him to life and until that was destroyed, he would still be capable of returning. Either way though, it would mean that Voldemort would not be totally and completely defeated. But then there's the other reason, and I'm sure this was a far less motivating reason for Harry because he's just simply so noble, is that in that scenario where Harry chooses death is that Harry himself would remain dead, which I personally would find a lot harder to stomach. And so by coming back, he is able to defeat Nagini, or in this case, Neville eventually does, and also once and for all, take down Voldemort Prime. But so that still leaves one major stone left unturned. And that is while living is of course still preferable to death, one of the major themes of the story is that death is not necessarily a bad thing. It can be a good thing and at some point to be accepted. And it's Harry's ability to embrace this particular idea that sets him apart from 
every other character and what ultimately makes him the master of death. But if death isn't considered a bad thing, then in some way isn't Voldemort's defeat a like mercy style of fate? Like we know that Voldemort fears death above all else, but we also see lots of other characters who have already passed on. James, Lily, Sirius, Remus, and Cedric, and they all seem okay. Does that mean that somehow despite all of his other evil that in the afterlife, Voldemort might actually too be all right? And the answer here is no, but to his credit, Harry does try to give him this. If you will recall, early on in Deathly Hallows, Hermione has discovered a piece of information as to how one might actually go about reassembling their fragmented pieces of soul. Remorse, said Hermione. You've got to really feel what you've done. There's a footnote. Apparently the pain of it can destroy you. I can't see Voldemort attempting it somehow. Can you? But still, in the final battle, Harry does offer Voldemort exactly this opportunity. Before you try to kill me, I'd advise you to think about what you've done. Think and try for some remorse, Riddle. But if you think about it, it's kind of like, to what end is Harry going for here? Because all of the Horcruxes are destroyed. They're is no reassembling of the fragments of his soul left on the table. And the thing is, that's not even what Harry's offering. He's not offering a chance at redemption or even reassembling the pieces of his soul. Instead, what he's offering is exactly what Dumbledore explained would happen if Harry were to say, board a train. He would just simply move on, to leave limbo and to pass on to the actual afterlife. And because Harry has already traveled to limbo before with Voldemort, he knows what happens to him otherwise. It's the fledgling skeletal baby thing. In fact, he even tells him so. It's your one last chance, said Harry. It's all you've got left. I've seen what you'll be otherwise. Be a man, try, try for some remorse. Harry is a good enough person that he is trying to save even Voldemort from what his fate will be. But of course, Voldemort is Voldemort and of course refuses. And so instead, after the final Avada Kedavra curse backfires on him, he does not pass on to the afterlife. He is forever trapped inside of Limbo as that maimed version of his soul, completely and utterly unanchored from life and destined to suffer for eternity, unable to live, and unable to die. It's actually this exact same explanation, in case you're curious, why Voldemort is never able to return as a ghost. But there you go, guys. That is what Voldemort would have seen inside of King's Cross and what happened to him after he dies, if you can even call it that. But as ever, guys, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you'd like to check out our entire super cut of what if Neville had been the chosen one, it is a big, long series, but it is all available in one big block with no ads or any other interruptions. You can check that out right over here. But otherwise, until next time, bye.